All right, our world is full of difficulty, and we can we cannot difficulty fix our world, prove our world. We're going to have it no matter what. So what I was saying was, I am thankful to each one of you for a couple of reasons. Number one, I love being up here and worshiping with you. I wa- I love watching you interact with one another. I love just just being able to to be able to be a a ministry to you during this time and watching your responsiveness. But the second thing is, Hope Chapel has become such a good church home for my son. And so I'm thankful for that. He's got good friends who love Jesus, who point him towards Jesus. And there's nothing more a dad could ask for. Well, there's a lot more I guess I could ask for. But there's, there's not much more a dad could ask for than to watch your son out in life with good men surrounding him who love Jesus. And so I I thank you for that so much. I also want to thank Alan and the whole team. Uh, You realize we were just singing the book of Romans. I mean, we we sang Romans over and over and over again. I'm sitting there thinking about my Sunday school lesson tomorrow morning, Romans chapter 5. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, the truths that we were singing. Don't you wish you could bottle all that up and just constantly 24-7 live in the reality of all of that? So thank you so much to all the worship team and what they did. Don, thank you for just the whole process of getting me here and being patient with me about notes. Um, I had a lot going on. If you were at the men's breakfast you heard about that I was going to go to Tennessee and Canada. Well, all that happened, and we are on our way to Tennessee. So I had to finish up at Biola, and then I was down at a missionary training base in Brazil, training some missionaries there who were going to unreached people groups. Then I had to come home. We had to sell our home. and we Actually, it sold while I was in Brazil. We had to go to Tennessee and you know Canada, and they voted me in, and we had to buy a home there. So we're just constant. I feel like I'm on my phone all the time trying to deal with the inspection reports and, you know, what do I have to do here? And then signing this document for the sale of our house here. We close on the 9th. We don't close there till July 31st because they can't be out to then. So we've got a lot of things going on. I'm about to make two cross-country trips, driving car number one and then driving car number two. I hate driving across the United States of America, but I'm going to do it. But Don put up with me through all that, just trying to get him stuff. And here we are. Uh, We're at the last session. I also asked Don if I could finish speaking tonight because I've got a Sunday school class back in Long Beach at Cornerstone Church who is grieving the fact that I'm leaving. And I did not want to be gone from them one more week. I I wanted to give them tomorrow morning and June 11th. We've been working our way through Romans and I just I just wanted to be where I'm feeling tears right now. I just wanted to be with them. And so thank you. Oh, my goodness. Next two weeks are going to be bad there, uh, but we know we're moving towards something, and so we're grateful for that. So now tonight, hopefully you all have notes, and we want to get into the third session here. And so we, this is the third of three questions that we want to ask. The first one was, does God have anything to say about what it means to be a man? What do you think? Yes. Okay, so Genesis 1 and 2, ponder those chapters over and over. Look at those things. Think about not just what it teaches, but what it means. Now, we're going to really start zero in on that a little bit tonight. The second question was, why is it not natural to be the men that God has created us to be? Well, the fall happened. We're fallen individuals. We live in a world that's full of difficulty. Our response to difficulty is not always to put our eyes on the Lord and look to him in our time of trouble. We often look to created things and we try to numb the pain. We try to find some sense of satisfaction apart from Jesus. Sometimes Jesus says, wait, we don't like that. Especially when we can have something now. And so that's a difficulty for us. And we have to realize if we just stay the course, we will be conformed to this world. So we have to be active, intentional, and we have to be seeking God so that we can be transformed. Well, now tonight we get to the third question. How is God recreating us to be the men that he has called us to be? And so again, I have a lot in your notes uh, that we're going to be going through, but let me just get us to think about the point. The point is this, living as men, we must be, and here's your first blank, missionally focused. 
missionally focused because we have a calling to be ambassadors who represent Christ to our world, inviting them, talking about the world, in other words, everyone in our realm of influence, we are ambassadors to them, we represent Christ to them, and we are inviting them into a deepening love for our Savior. If they don't know Jesus, then we're evangelizing. That's the word we use. We're, we're, we're inviting them to know Jesus, to give their life to Jesus. If they do know Jesus, then we're discipling them. We're inviting them to love Jesus even more deeply in their life. It doesn't matter. Everyone in our realm of influence, we are inviting them to Jesus in a deeper way. And so it takes intentionality and repentance for us to do this. We're not going to do this naturally. This is supernaturally. And so we have to live as holy men. It takes intentionality, repentance. We need to be called to the purposes of God. It must grow in us. So the question before us is, what does it mean? to live a godly life that evidences the redeemed heart that we now have because we are new creatures in Christ. We have to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. His sanctifying work continues in us. We are saved. We are being saved. We will be saved. So these are processes that are taking place in our heart. And so I have two points that I want to make on this first page. First, we must find our true meaning in, in and by being a part of what God is doing in this world. We could look at many verses, but here's two. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. I want us to continue uh, consider what it says here. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, wish we could just read the whole thing. I mean, think about verses like verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, etc. But then we get down to verse 20, and it says there, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating through us. I mean, think about that. How is God entreating the world? Through us, because we are as ambassadors. And so we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, and Paul continues there. But what do ambassadors do? They represent. That's what ambassadors do. And so in our life, we are representing. We represent Christ. We represent him. We represent his godly life everywhere we go, in our families, in our workplaces, in our churches, as husbands, fathers, you know, wherever it might be, with our friends. So think about that. Our lives must be missionally focused. We are ambassadors who represent Christ to the world. 1 Peter 2.9 is a second passage that I want us to go to. Again, it'd be fun to spend time in 1 Peter chapter 2 and all that Peter is writing there. But in verse 9, he, he pulls in all of this Old Testament imagery for you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so we we have a calling then to proclaim the excellencies of Christ who has done all this amazing work for us. We are witnesses of Christ. If we grew up in the church, we know the Great Commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. I mean, we we memorized that verse at some point in time. But that is who we are. We are ambassadors who represent Christ and we proclaim the good news of Jesus to a world that needs to hear. And so again, this is wherever we go. If we do it as fathers, I mean, my father led me to the Lord. And so I, I praise the Lord for that. Now, my dad actually had to leave his, leave his father to the Lord. Grew up in a Southern Baptist church where they did not preach the gospel. And so my dad got saved outside of the church and brought that into his family. His mom and dad both got saved. But as fathers, we do this. As husbands, we do this in the workplace, in our neighborhoods, with our friends. I mean, we we could do so many things with it right now. Do you know the names of your neighbors? I mean, those are good questions to ask. I mean, do we know who they are? Do we know their stories? I play basketball with all these guys. And one of the main things I, I do there is proclaim the excellencies of Christ. And I want you to know, we have to stay the course in these kinds of things. I I, I never know the kind of impact I'm having on these guys. I mean, they've seen the good, bad, and ugly of David Talley. 
on the basketball court. And, you know, I just stayed the course with them. I've taken many of them out for breakfast. But as I'm leaving on, I think, next, next Friday night, whatever the date is for that, um, they or it's coming up Friday night, they're having a going away party for me. I've seen a lot of guys come and go that play basketball with us. I've never seen a going away party. And I'm sitting back and I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, God, thank you. You've allowed me to have an impact in these men's lives. So much so that they're going to have this going away party. I think they, they, they're, they're framing a picture. I, I just got all these feelings because they're taking pictures and they're, they're doing things on the other side of the thing that divides the court and they're running over there and doing things. I think they're probably all signing it. I mean, I just, that's, we're supposed to be that kind of person that has that kind of impact in our life. And we never fully know what God is doing in people's hearts. So that's the first thing we need to, we need to realize that second, we need to be the men or the man that God has created us to be. So there's a chart in the back of your notes, very last thing in your notes, which, which says my understanding of the Bible's teaching on gender. That's a lot of information. We're not going to go through it tonight. I actually do have an article where I, I spell all this out, but, but what I'm trying to show you on this chart is Look at what the teaching is in Genesis 1. Look at what the teaching is in Genesis 2. Look what happens in Genesis 3, sin and its consequences. What becomes our fallen natural tendency? And then I take it to Ephesians 5, which is a marriage context, but it teaches us a lot about what it means to be a man in that context. And so I show what redemption is seeking to bring about in our lives. And so I'm going to use that as a main foundation. If you are married, I encourage you to look at that whole thing. It deals with husbands and wives on there. But the chart they have at the bottom of the page on page 12 is simply trying to pull together the information on a men. I want you to, on men, I want you to, what's that? Oh, so this is, a, this is right. This, these are all not connected together. The bottom of page two. Is, is there's a there's just a primary chart there that I want you to look at. That is all the information on the man. I want you to look at two columns. The first column, very last thing, the man is initiator leader. Yes. And then I want you to look at the last column, the very last thing. What does that look like? Loving sacrificial leadership. Now we're going to spell some of this out, but go to the top of the next page and let me try to make sure I'm looking at your pages. Top of the next page, I, again, I just, men, if you're married, look at that chart on the previous page. Look at that chart that's at the very end of your notes. I think it's really important for you. But I want us to broaden our focus because of why we're here. We, we're men, all different kinds of stages of life, all different kind of relational commitments. And I want us to understand the bigger picture. So what I've done is take that those notes from that last chart, and now I've tried to just summarize them in such a way that it's about manhood here. Now, I've made a huge mistake on this chart, so I want you to correct it first. In that first column, it should be Genesis 1 and 2. Okay, on that first column, on page eight, uh, page 3, it should be Genesis 1 and 2. In the second column, you can mark out Genesis, Genesis 2. It actually should be the title in the third column. It should say, in the second column, Genesis 3, sin and its consequences. Is everybody with me yes. on this? And then the third column, you can mark that out because that's really in the second column. The third column is really what you find in the fourth column title, Fallen Natural Tendency. Is everybody with me? Yes. So what is the title of the fourth column? The Transformed Life. That's what the fourth column is. And that's what we're focused on in this session. We want to think about what does the transformed life look like? So when we get to that fourth column, man, his primary role, the man or the husband is to lead and care for his world. Now think about your world, your realm of influence, Where, wherever it is you go. I, I use this right here, wherever I go, whatever is in my realm of influence, I am to be someone who leads and cares for the people who are in my realm of influence at the time. In what kind of way? Well, as Christ does the church. And we are to love others. In what kind of way? As Christ does the church. And as his own body. So we are to lead 
and we are to love. And so at the bottom, I simply have their loving, sacrificial leadership. Now, I'm going to start developing a definition of what it means to be a man. So look all in bold there. So based on the above, the man, all of us in this room, is to be the initiator leader in his world who leads with a loving, sacrificial leadership as an ambassador for Christ, which means representing Christ's godly life and as a witness of Christ, which means proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Is everybody with me on this definition? So this is a working definition of what it means to be a man. Now, what would be good? We could just stop the session right now and we could begin talking to one another. What does this look like in everyday life? Because that's what really matters. Not just the definition, but what does it look like in everyday life? Jesus told the disciples, you go into all the world and teach them to observe. Not just the mind, not just the good definition, but how do you actually live that in life? So I gave you a chart yesterday. And so that's going to be on your next page where we only looked, we, we only looked at what was in the left-hand column. There was a right-hand column that we left completely blank. So we can go to that column right now. It's very, or that chart on page four, it's very important that we understand this. The right, the left-hand column are the things that we need to repent of. This is our natural fallen tendency. This is how an idolatrous man lives his life. Remember the main passion, the commitment, because we live in a world of difficulty, there's a heightened sense of vulnerability. There's a heightened sense of thirstiness. That works its way out. And so rather than look to our creator, Romans chapter one, we look to created things. And basically, I wish we had time to go to Isaiah 44, I think it is, where we, we see the, the essence of idolatry, which is deliver me for you are my God. I'm in pain. I'm hurting. Life isn't working out. I'm gonna look somewhere for some deliverance. I want a sense of relief. I just wanna feel good for just a little bit. And so it's the created things that God has given to us to enjoy that we pervert and make them idols and we bow down and worship them and we live for them. We can become consumed by them. When we become addicted to them, it consumes all of our waking moments, all of our thought life. You've been there. You know what that's like to struggle in that kind of way. And and so we've got we've got this idolatrous living that we've got to be careful about. Now, when we get to the right hand column, I'm trying to summarize the way a godly man might live. Again, both the idolatrous man and the godly man are bumping up against difficulty. And when we do, world isn't work, the world isn't working out the way we want it to work out. We feel vulnerable. My world is broken. I can't fix it. I can't stop all these things from happening. I'm thirsty. I long for more. I want to feel good. I, I want to have fellowship. I want things to work out and it's not happening Both are bumping up against the same difficulty. One looks to idols, created things for satisfaction. The godly man begins to put his trust somewhere else. And so we've got to realize we can't just put answers into this chart. We actually have to be thinking about how to live this life out. But we're going to begin by putting answers in there. So how does a godly man live? He bumps up against the difficulty of life, feels vulnerable, feels thirsty, to deal with one's exposed sense of vulnerability. Um, So I'm looking at the right-hand column now. A man will look to the only one who can save, not just from the penalty of sin and hell, but the only one who can save in everyday life and put his trust in him while obediently doing his will on this earth, no matter what the cost. I want us to look at 1 Peter chapter 4. In verse 19, first Peter chapter four, verse 19, first Peter is a book on suffering. So think about the early church. I've I've been reading the book of Acts. And so I was in the early chapters of Acts this morning with the stoning of Stephen. When Stephen is put to death, they laid the gar their garments at the feet of Saul, the persecutor of the church. And Saul began going house to house and dragging people off to prison. Well, the early church was scattered at that point. Well, Peter is a shepherd to them and he writes them a letter. And so he's he's writing to them, how do you live in the midst of suffering? 
Well, when we get down to chapter four, verse 19, it, it helps us understand how do we live in the midst of difficulty? Therefore, let those who suffer or those who bump up against difficulty in everyday life, disease, flat tires, um, getting fired from your job, not having enough money at the end of the month to pay your bills, whatever it might be, let those who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So in the midst of the mess of life, what do you do? The main passion is you trust and obey. You remember the hymn, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Listen, this isn't rocket science. We've been singing these kinds of songs for years and we sing them because they're true. Trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And I give you some other verses to look at there. I mean, Isaiah 26, I just, I have to read it. I know I'm gonna botch it if I try to quote it, but I love the verse. The steadfast of mind, you will keep in perfect peace because that one trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord, for in God, the Lord, we have an everlasting rock. That's why we put our trust there is because of who he is. So what is the commitment of the one who's living the godly life? He bumps up against his difficulty. Life is out of control. He can't difficulty proof his world. He can't stop all these things from happening. I mean, his wife may be fighting back. Others may be fighting back in his world. His work is fighting back and falling apart. He can't always be the best. He can't always make things happen the way he wants to. He can't always make the sales that he wants to. Can't always preach the sermon that he wants to. Can't always be the leader of the meeting the way he wants to. What's the commitment? I will entrust myself to my faithful creator and do what is right. That's the commitment there. I will entrust myself to my faithful creator and do what's right. You see it right there. His passion is to trust and obey. He's not trying to fix his world. He's try, not trying to make something happen that's not happening. He's got his eyes on Jesus. And how long does he keep his eyes there? Until he is gracious to us. Keep your eyes there. You keep looking to him. You, you, you trust him. God knows what he's doing. When we bump up against all these things in life and it doesn't work out the way we want to, my favorite theological term, you won't find in any theology book, it's this, God's got this. That's it right there. He's got this. And so we, we need to understand that. But not only is there a heightened sense of vulnerability, there's also a heightened sense of, sense of thirstiness. Remember, the idolatrous man, his main passion is anything that satisfies or numbs the pain. His commitment, I will not be found lacking. Well, now when we get to the godly man, to deal with one's heightened sense of thirstiness, a man will pursue the Lord for his satisfaction. Not a computer screen with a naked woman on it. Instead, pursue the Lord. Not late hours at work so you can keep on moving up the, 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 the priority list or the keep on getting promoted. Not late hours at work so you can have more money. All these kind of things. No, we'll pursue the Lord for his satisfaction waiting on him to provide in his way and in his time, believing that he is good. God is good all the time. All the time. It's easy to say that, isn't it? But do we believe it? I mean, do we believe it when life isn't working out the way we want it to? Do we believe it in the times where life seems like it's out of control? So let's look at Romans chapter eight. Just incredible passage. I, I love the book of Romans. Oh my goodness. I've always said, if I'm ever going to memorize a book, it's going to be Romans. And I still haven't done it yet. Now I'm old, but I still should go for it anyway. I also want to play the drums. I should get started on that too. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 18. Man, we could go through the whole chapter, but let me just read a few verses. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory of that is to be revealed to us. See the perspective that Paul is trying to get us? Yeah. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says the same thing. Momentary light affliction is nothing to be compared to the eternal weight of glory. He says, these sufferings that we're going through, what, what is it? Disease? Did you lose your job? 
Did the stock market crash and you lost all, lost all your retirement money? Was it a flat tire on the way down the mountain and there's not another car coming by forever and your spare is flat and you're just stuck here? I mean, what is it that might happen in our lives? Those sufferings are, for this present time, are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's to be revealed to us. For the anxious, anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. We read that in Genesis chapter three. It's all messed up, the world in which we live. It's full of difficulty, subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation also itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans, decay and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And so it just goes on through there, and, and you get to the end, and Paul's just breaking out in praise at that point in time at the end of the chapter. Listen, we're thirsty. We long for more. What we're longing for is paradise. And because we were created for that. Every one of you in this room were created for the Garden of Eden, but you don't live there. You live in a broken world. And all we have right now is the option to trust God and obey him in the midst of all this while we wait eagerly for him to show up now. And if he never shows up, for him to show up on that day when he makes all things new again. No more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. All those things are gone. But do you understand when we cry out to the Lord to heal us of disease, sometimes he doesn't and we die. And when we cry out to him with prayers and just begging God to move, we may go our entire life without ever seeing an answer to that. But that doesn't mean we don't have hope. Paul says this this present affliction is nothing to be compared to that glory that awaits us. We have to fix our eyes on that glory that awaits us. What is the main passion of a man who's trying to live godly in the midst of difficulty? His main passion is waiting eagerly, waiting eagerly and embracing whatever God offers as our good. He's waiting eagerly and he's embracing whatever God offers as our good. You see, even difficulty in this world is for our good. Okay, we, we've already said it. God is good all the time, all the time God is good. Yeah. So when your life falls apart, is God good? Yes. yes. Does God know what he's doing? Yes, God's got this. Well, I don't understand. My second favorite theological term is, well, that's above your pay grade. <laughs> That's why you don't understand what's going on right now. But we have to recognize that God knows what he's doing in our lives. He knows that. And so we wait on him and we embrace whatever he has. I Recently, I got stuck in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I, I'm just, I was so anxious to get back to my family. I had so much going on. Our flight was delayed. We got to Sao Paulo late. The Delta, rep- I shouldn't be tattling on Delta. The Delta representative was not at their booth and we had time to get to our gate. We just needed a boarding pass. Hello, someone give us a boarding pass. I just wanted a boarding pass. I just wanted to get on the plane. I just wanted to go home. I did not want to stay in San Paulo. Well, God had other plans. Can I embrace that? I'm not very good at embracing that. But I was about to preach on Philippians 4 and the message of what that sermon was, was just pounding me. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all, even the Delta representative. (laughs) Because the Lord is at hand. And so live in that kind of way. And so I'm just like, ah, give me a ticket. I need a boarding pass. Just let me decide if I can get to the gate in time. And then boom, boom, boom. The Holy Spirit was at work in me. And it's like, okay, God, you've got this. I'm not happy, God, because I don't want to stay in Sao Paulo. But now, why do you have me here? What are, what are you up to? What are you teaching my wife there who's carrying all these things on her own? What are you teaching me while I'm here? 
See, God's got this. And so I have to wait eagerly and embrace whatever God offers as our good. And so what is the commitment? The commitment is I will wait eagerly for God's provisions and embrace whatever God offers as for my good. Listen, that is difficult to do in day-to-day living. It can be really difficult to do. Think about how quickly you can lose it. Think about how quickly you can grumble about something, complain about something. Where'd that waiter go? I want some more iced tea. (laughs) Okay? Now, maybe the waiter needs to be better at what he or she is doing. I I don't know. But but we've got these things that we have to think through in life. God's got this. And if we don't understand, it's above our pay grade. But we're waiting eagerly for him to come through. We trust and we obey and we wait eagerly for his provision. I mean, think about it. We've got to do this. We've got to, if you're married, you've got to guide your wife through this. If you've got kids, you've got to guide your kids through all of this. You've got a realm of influence in your life. You've got to guide other people through this. You've got to model it and you've got to teach it. Paul says to the church at Corinth, you imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that's what all of us as men should be able to say. To those in our realm of influence, imitate me, I'm imitating Christ. Let's do, we're in this together. Let's do it. And we model it by living this kind of life. Now, let's begin pulling all this together. Now, I'm going to expand our definition. You're going to say, well, this definition is going to get out of control. Look at that. The man is to be the initiator leader in his world who leads with a loving, sacrificial leadership as an ambassador for Christ, which means representing his godly life, and as a witness of Christ, which means proclaiming the good news, who... When his vulnerability is exposed, entrusts himself to a faithful creator and does what is right, crushing the commitment to do whatever makes his life work. And when his thirst is heightened, he waits eagerly and embraces whatever God offers as his good, crushing the commitment to not be found lacking. See, this is transformed living that's taking place. And so the definition is getting bigger. And I'm only going to add to it. There's more. I want us to think through several resources that are out there. I don't know how many of you have ever run into um, the men's fraternity. I think it's called something else now. It was put out by um, Right Now Media. But in the men's fraternity, they they develop four aspects of masculinity. Number one, a man is, number one, one who rejects passivity. Okay, he rejects passivity. In other words, he leads, he initiates, he moves toward people and acts for their good. Doesn't sit back and watch and wait for another to make the move. He's on it. He's caring for his world. He's loving his world. Number two, accepts responsibility. A man knows he has a calling in this world that God has created. He does not shrink back from his responsibility, leave it to his wife, leave it to someone else. If there's a need, he engages. His eyes even look around for anything around him that needs attention, some kind of strong love. As men, we notice the one who comes into church and sits by themselves. We we notice that person and we move toward them. Oh, it's good to hang out with our friends and slap each other on the back, give each other a hug. I love you, bro. But there's people all over the church that are isolated and lonely. I go to a church where there's a lot of widows and widowers and they just sneak in the back door and sit down. And then they sneak out the back door and they leave. Who's going to reach out to them? We accept that responsibility. Number three, leads courageously. And I call this (laughs) taking the first bullet in moments of difficulty. He has the hard conversations guided by love and grace. And although he's not unnecessarily hasty, he does not wait until it's safe. He's built with the willingness to pay whatever the cost might be for love. You see, we're wired for that. And how oftentimes are men hiding behind their wives? Oh, whatever you think. And oftentimes the reason we're saying that, number one is maybe we just don't care. Perhaps we should. But another reason is, you know what? If it blows up in her face, I, I, didn't, I didn't decide to do that. That's not on me. That's what you wanted to do. Oftentimes that's the goal behind it. We should care about things and we should willingly engage the process and make decisions. And if it falls apart, take the first bullet. 
not, I told you it wouldn't work out, or this is what you wanted to do. I wasn't really up necessarily for it. No, we take the first bullet. Like we just bought a house in Tennessee. It wasn't my first choice. I wanted to be on the lake. Well, let's say that we've lived in the house five years and things start really falling apart. The air conditioner goes out. The roof needs to be replaced. And Tony goes, man, this is just not working out for us. I didn't want the house in the first place, Tony. <laughs> How's that for being a man? No. <laughs> See, it doesn't matter who made the decision. I'm going to embrace it. And I'm going to lead the way for my family. I'm not going to leave my wife out to hang. Other people going, yeah, this is the house Joni wanted. Look at what a pathetic mess it is right now. She wanted it, though. We're just passing it off. <laughs> Number four, lives for eternal, eternity, or I put in parentheses there, or missionally. He's motivated by his love for his Savior in the kingdom that awaits him. So now let me expand that definition out even more. Now that we think about rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, lives for eternity, it's getting really long now. The man is to be the initiator leader in his world who leads with a loving, sacrificial leadership as an ambassador for Christ, representing his godly life, and as a witness of Christ, proclaiming the good news, whose leadership rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, lives for eternity, who, when his vulnerability is exposed, entrusts himself to a faithful creator and does what is right, crushing the commitment to do whatever makes his life work. And when his thirst is heightened, waits eagerly and embraces whatever God offers as his good, crushing the commitment to not be found lacking rather than turning to his idols. Wow. 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 What does that look like in everyday life? Well, men's fraternity goes on. He says there's four faces of masculinity. And I think I got these right. I, I did this from memory. A man is one who, number one, lives as a king. In other words, he lives with righteousness, treating others in a way that honors them and points them to Jesus, offering an example of godliness. He lives, number two, as a warrior. He lives with justice, looking out for people, righting the wrongs of those around him. When righteousness is exhort, ex ignored, he stands up for righteousness. Amen. He doesn't just watch it happen. Oh, poor people. They're being mugged on the side of the road right now. Oh. That's awful. What a horrible world we live in. No, a man moves towards that. Willingly moves towards that. Number three, he lives as a friend with accountability, following the godly examples of those who walk before him. Okay, we're gonna watch this. Following the godly examples of those who walk before him, fellowshipping with those who walk beside him through the struggles of life and leading a generation who walks behind him, pointing to the way of wisdom. In all relationships, he is one who is encouraging a passion for Jesus as all fight for holiness in daily living. We are fighting for one another's holiness. And that's what this kind of man does. And then number four, as a lover, he lives with godly passion towards his wife, family, leading them towards Jesus, walking with them through life struggles and encouraging them to keep their eyes on Jesus and on the future glory that awaits them. He nurtures their souls and leads them in obedience. We can expand that out. If you're not married, that's fine. This is what you do with everybody in your world. This kind of man you are. So again, this is putting us over the top. Um, I, I put there, but it provides us with a lot of good foundation to build on this summit is just part of our journey as we summit. In life, we are summiting. We continue to go up. We need to go further. And so here it is. The man is to be initiator, leader in his world who leads with a loving, sacrificial leadership as an ambassador for Christ, representing his godly life, and as a witness of Christ, proclaiming the good news, whose leadership rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, lives for eternity, who... When his vulnerability is exposed and trusts himself to a faithful creator and does what is right, crushing the commitment to do whatever makes his life work. When his thirst is heightened, waits eagerly and embraces whatever God offers as his good, crushing the commitment to not be found lacking rather than turning to his idols. And he does all of this by appropriately engaging each moment as a king living with righteousness as a warrior living with justice, as a friend living with accountability, and as a lover living with godly passion towards others, especially his wife and children. We could add to the end. I mean, this is long. 
So how do we summarize this? This is just pulling together a lot of ideas. And so I actually try to shrink it down just a little bit. Here we, here it goes. A man is one who actively, courageously, passionately, and sacrificially moves toward and engages others for their good, according to the need of the moment, and for Christ's glory, and according to his citizenship in heaven. So just think about that for a moment. Every moment, there's an active, courageous, passionate, sacrificial movement toward others, and it's always for their good. Not looking out for yourself, you're looking out for the good of others. A man is someone who's always moving toward seeking how he can be of help, how he can be of assistance. How can that, how can they be led towards Jesus? How can he lay down his life so that others benefit from this? We're wired for this, men. And something is broken inside of us that needs to be transformed so that we once again are the men that God has called us to be. And it's gonna look something like this. I want us to look at Isaiah 32. What a powerful picture this is, I think, of what it means to be a man. The context is talking about a a king who is coming. Isaiah chapter 32, verse one. Listen to this. I I want you to grasp this word picture. Behold, a king will reign righteously and princes will rule justly. And each will be like a refuge from the wind. Can I say that's a good description of a man? That we are a refuge from the wind. That we are a shelter from the storm that we are like streams of water in a dry country, that we are like shade of a huge rock in a parched land. I think that provides us with a good picture of what it means to be a man. We we are one who acts for the benefit of others as we represent our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we lay down our lives. We proclaim the good news. Wherever people are, if they need to be saved, we are evangelizing, leading them to Christ. If they are in Christ, we are building them up in the body of Christ and helping them to mature in Christ. Everything is about Christ, 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 Christ. And we're just laying it all down. Now, I'm not giving you one more thing to do in life. I'm simply giving you someone to be in life. Whatever your vocation is, whatever your situation is in life, maybe you have 10 kids, I don't know. Whatever that situation is, maybe you live alone. We're talking about who you are in Christ as a man who's been redeemed. We're trying to get a picture of that. And so you might even take a verse like Isaiah 32 too and think, what does this look like in life? What does it mean for me to be this kind of man at work? What does it mean for me to be this kind of man in whatever living environment, whether it's your home with a wife and children or other people that you share a living situation with or people who are in your apartment building, your neighbors? What what does that look like? What does it mean to, to live like this in your church? What does it mean to live like this in the world? in which we live. So let's go all the way back to the uh, illustration I used at the very beginning. There's those young guys. (laughs) Ooh, man, look at me. I got it going. (laughs) Flirting with the young lady. That's not masculinity. There's nothing about their actions right there that look anything like Isaiah 32 too. There's nothing about their actions that look anything like this summary definition that we have. As men, we are called to pass this on to the next generation. We've got to teach men to be men. Titus chapter two, older men, teach the younger men. Older women, teach the younger women. My wife will say things to my face. Did you see how she was dressed? And I'll say, I tried to look the other way, I promise. (laughs) But yes, I did see. (laughs) Why does she do that? And I say, Joni, Titus chapter two, who's going to tell her? Who's going to tell her? 
that that's not an appropriate way to dress. When these guys spill their drink over there in the Brea Community Center and they're just laughing and doing their muscles and they leave their mess there, who's going to tell them? Who's going to come alongside? Now, you don't want to become the, the, the man cop. Ah, I saw you do that. That's not very manly of you. Let me tell you what it means to be a man. But as we live in our world, don't we have to pass this on? We have to pass it on in some kind of way. Being a Biola professor, man, I had student after student in my office. And just watching the way they lived life, I would just say to them, what are you going to do one day when you're employed and you oversleep? And you have a presentation to give with a multi-million dollar company and your job depends on you being there and doing your job. What are you going to tell your boss? I slept in my alarm. Is, is, that what you're, is that what you're going to tell your boss? No, actually, you're just going to go clean your office out. And you're going to be done. How do you sleep through an exam? How do you, how do, you do that? And so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be mean to them. I'm trying to teach them how to live life in the midst of all of this. We've got to learn to find ways to help people be men. Now, what we don't want to do is pour contempt on them and shame on them. We've got to find a way to do that that invites them into a deeper relationship with Jesus. Here's the way I understand it. I know what my struggles are in life, and so I assume I know a little bit about what your struggles are. So, you know your struggles in life. You know a little bit about the struggles of men around you. We're all different. We all struggle with different things. But we also struggle similarly by looking away from God and trying to find satisfaction in creative things. We've got to help one another grow up. We've got to help one another present a picture of what Isaiah 32.2 is. But we need to know more of what it looks like in life. There, there's so much we could do right here. So Mike and Don, I'm giving you guys lots of stuff that you can do later on. What does this mean in the home? All we have is a definition. What, what, what does that mean in the home when you and your wife are in an argument? Okay, you and your children are at odds. What does that look like when your neighbor has junk growing over your fence into your yard and you're constantly having to keep it trimmed. Does that sound like it made this a little bit too close to home for me? <laughs> now you're yeah, yes. It's, it's obvious. It's someone that I know. <laughs> now, what does that mean in times like that? What does that mean when you don't get promoted and yet you're working your rear off and someone else who's just lazy gets the promotion? Well, how, do you, how do you live in the midst of all of that? What does it mean in the workplace? What does it mean in our friendships? What does it mean in the church? As men, we will, and here's just some things I, need, I think that we need to think about. We will bring order to our world. We will lead those around us. We will point others to Jesus. We will provide a model for others to follow. We will live for God's purposes. And then we start thinking even more practically. Practically as men, we will pick up after ourselves. We will be polite to others. Young men in this room, I was just reading a passage in Leviticus where it it talks about give honor to those who have gray hair. (laughs) What does that look like in in everyday life? I I walk across Biola's campus and here's what students say. Hey, Tally! (laughs) Tally? How, How did I become... Tally. You see, I don't, I don't demand honor from them, but is that honorable? No. Hey, Tally. Hey, dude. I've had people walk in my office. Hey, dude. <laughs> dude? <laughs> what does it mean to show honor? I really work hard in my life, and I'm not good at it at all. But when someone's older than me, I really work hard to say Mr. and Mrs. Just... I'm just trying to work hard. Now I'm going to a whole church <laughs> full of people older than me. Mr. and Mrs. They'll probably say, would you quit telling me that? Make me feel old. Just call me Toby. All right, I'll call you Toby. I can do that. But how do we show honor? I mean, what does that look like to be polite and show honor? We will clean our area, whatever that is, our rooms, make our beds, fold our clothes. We will hold doors for ladies, even if they don't like it. We will clean up dishes in the kitchen. 
We will put our friends and family first. We will begin discussions about Jesus, about the Bible. We'll reach out to our neighbors in some kind of way. We'll know their names. We'll keep work in perspective. There's something way bigger to live for than the next promotion or making more money. We'll enter the sanctuary and actually talk with others. Whatever your habit is, some people like sanctuaries to be a sanctuary where you just prepare to meet the Lord. Others, it's a fellowship hall. I've been in your church. I think it's more like a fellowship hall, I think. And so when you enter, talk to people. Don't say, every time I go to that church, nobody talks to me. Okay, be a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. We'll ask questions to get to know people better. We'll engage with people. We'll use our finances to bless others. If I could just encourage, especially the young people, when you start getting raises in life, keep your living standard the same. And use the excess to bless people around you. Just do it. It's so much fun. It's just a lot of fun. Give $100 tips if you ever feel led to. Just, Just put it down. If you can afford it, why not bless that person and do that for them? When you buy a new car, why don't you give your old car away? Just give it to someone. God's blessed you. Bless someone else. Think about your tithes and your offerings, however you look at that in your church. Make your tithe your bare minimum and then bless missionaries or other people, single moms, whatever it might be. Just bless them. Just bless them. Use your finances. Practice disciplines that lead to growth. You want to know why you get up and read your Bible and pray every day? It's because you want to be the man that God has called you to be. So that you can be that man to others as well. And so you got to practice disciplines like this in your life. And there's, there's just more we could say about that, isn't there? We could go... The next page is blank in my notes, so the next page must be your chart in your notes. But what we've done in this in this summit together is we've set out three questions. Does God's word say anything about being a man? Why is it so difficult for us to live this out? Well, Genesis chapter three. And then what does it mean for us to recapture that essence of what means to be a man. And I've given you a ton of information and just tried to give you lots of different long definitions, tried to whittle it down to one thing, but here's what you have to do. And this is part of being a man. You take all of this seriously and you all go your separate ways or you get together with other men in this group and you sit down and you talk about what does this look like in everyday life? Let's do it. Let's go for it together. You you begin to engage life together and think about what does it mean to turn away from our idols and trust and obey and wait eagerly for God's provision, embracing whatever he brings into our life as for our good. How do we do that together? See, this, this summit, all I've done is begin a discussion. That's all I've done here is begin a discussion. I've tried to give you a foundation I've tried to build on it a little bit. I've tried to take you to God's word so that you can actually, beyond this time, beyond these notes, actually look at what God's word has to say. But this is just the beginning for you. We all have to work this out in our lives and ask God, teach us, what does this look like? If you're married, you might want to talk to your wife about some of these things. Honey, what, what does this look like? She'll probably have a lot of good advice (laughs) for what that will look like. And you know what? What I found in working with men and by looking at my own life, we might be really good at starting things and then we drop the ball. Anybody been there? Okay, I've been there. Just drop the ball. So here's my advice. Repent and pick the ball up. And then when you drop it, repent and pick the ball up. And then go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 and pray that prayer. Lord, all these things that you're working in my heart, please let them see the light of day and bring other men into it. Invite someone into it. I made four commitments up at the Men's Summit this weekend and I need some help. Can you walk through life with me? I want to maintain these four commitments. Can you help me do that? Bring someone in. 
and let them walk with you. Let them refine it. Let them help you think about what it looks like in the workplace, what it looks like in the home, what it looks like in your neighborhood, what it looks like at the church. And be the man that God has created you to be. So what I want us to do now is close in a word of prayer. And I'm going to get on my knees. And you can get on your knees if you want to. But let's, let's just commit our lives to the Lord. <laughs> let's just begin all around the room. Just cry out to the Lord. Whatever it is you want to say to him. Lord, we bow before you as men right now. Here we are to worship. Here we are to bow down. Here we are to say that you are our God. So Lord, forgive us for the created things that we turn to. Forgive us for the ways that we've demanded relief in this world in ways that are not honoring to you, not glorifying to you. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we've dropped the ball, that we haven't been the men that you have transformed us to be in Christ. And Lord, we ask that you would now take your word and make it alive and powerful and cause it to explode in each of our hearts. Lord, help us. I know that all around this room, there are desires right now. That desires have been formed throughout the last two days. I've even heard conversations, people having no idea that I was walking up behind them. And I've heard them talking with one another, sharing with one another, conviction, things that you're doing in their hearts. Lord, all around the room, you are doing that. And we beg you that this would just not be a mountain high. Lord, we ask that this would be would bring about a steadfastness in our lives, a faithfulness in our lives, a continuous repentance of that old manner of man, that we, the ways in which we've been conformed to this world, that we would shed those things, that we would put those things to death and walk in newness of life. And Lord, we can't do that on our own. Holy Spirit, we need you to move in our lives powerfully. And men, you need one another to walk together. So Lord, give us a sense of mission. Help us to be on mission every moment of every day in our realm of influence to your glory and for our joy. Lord, invite us into what you're doing. Help us to participate in it until you come back or until we, our heart beats its very last beat. Lord, I pray that the things you're storing in our hearts right now, one day when we are surrounding your throne, we will rejoice over all the good work that you continue to do in us when we left this place. So Lord, we give our lives to you right now, all around the room. We pray that you would work. Please, Lord, we commit ourselves to you again right now. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you very much. I have to go to the mountain.
Dr. Kelly, thank you again.